welcome back to episode three of the Apex Files podcast presented by Race Comp Engineering. Um, I'm joined today by co-creator Larry Liu. Hey guys, what's going on? Known as LL Smooth. <laughs> <laughs> we just made that up. We totally made that up. Not as smooth as the next guy coming on. Oh, oh. this guy. <laughs> so, look, I remember almost eight years ago this same time, I'm in the car with uh, the Capex Racing team owner, Jim Huey, and I knew that we had a new driver coming. Uh, I did not know who he was. I hadn't heard of who it was. And um, Jim says, yeah, it's this guy named Estra. Or actually, everyone then pronounced it Estre, which I think is wrong. It's Estra. Um, and I was like, who? He's like, yeah, he's a <laughs> French guy, um, factory McLaren race car driver, GT3 category, just dynamite guy. And I was like, okay, yeah, whatever. Because, you know, you get new drivers, you learn to just roll with it. Um, unbeknownst to me, this driver, I had already been seeing his work, I'd already been seeing his talent <laughs> in the door McLaren GT3 Nurbert Ring lap record um, that everyone was in total awe of. He was also that same year rated as the, the, the seventh ranked GT driver in the world, in the world, um, in that new category too. Um, and Years prior to that, I'd watched him. I would be on the treadmill working out, and <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm you know I, I would choose like Porsche Cup Nurbert Ring laps um, on the treadmill because you can just burn an easy 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and this driver was fighting with the late great Sean Edwards. I mean, just unrelenting, uh, arguably the most talented two drivers at the top of their field at the time in Porsche Cup or Super Cup, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, for, yeah, Carrera Cup. And they were just just going at it straight away, just right away. Um, but as it would turn out, his splash into the American GT3 uh, series back then was the Pirelli World Challenge mm -hmm. would prove to be huge at the very wet opening event at COTA, Circuit of the <laughs> Americas, where <laughs> As uh, Greg Creamer, the then Pirelli World Challenge uh, broadcaster, said he, that Kevin put on, and I think I can quote, a doctoral thesis. Yeah, I mean, that was a crazy race, right? right? <laughs> In wet driving. I mean, crazy. And, and, and we'll get into it, but uh, today is truly an honor. It's a pleasure. I mean, you know, we, we've both followed this guy oh the God. entire time. Uh, we've watched him go from great to greater. <laughs> Um, and you know, it's not just us. I mean, obviously beyond the year we had, beyond the year I worked with him with K-Pax Racing in the States, that next year Porsche uh, Motorsports picked him up as a factory driver and he's been doing that ever since. And so it is really an honor. I mean, you know, as, as, as a track day guy, racer at best, um, before I got on track, when I pray to the motorsport gods of car control, <laughs> <laughs> there's like three people that I want to be given the gift of any <laughs> moment to maintain the, 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 the car on track. And, you know, one would be a current F1 driver. We don't need to go into that. One would be a passed away F1 driver, Senna. Mm -hmm. And then the other, the third would be, and I, I'm proud to say, Kevin yes. Estra. And so we present today to you on the Apex Files podcast, Kevin Estra, and we're going to get right into it right now. How are you? Good. Uh, good. Not too bad. Just uh, uh, we moved in a few, uh, a few, uh, two months ago now, and and my office is not that yet. So I'm in the, let's say, in a in a room where we do multiple stuff. So there's nothing set <laughs> with uh, decoration or whatever. But uh, soon, soon. Digging the. Uh... Digging the mustache there in the off season. No, 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 no. It's yeah. Well, I, I, I think I was too lazy to shave. It's not the mustache. But it's just I somehow what? I don't have enough. Uh, hold on, uh, it's, ask me something. Yeah, uh, I don't have enough there. You know, I'm young still. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No big canards coming off the side. Yeah. No, no, no. I think I'll still need twenty years or something to have a full beard. So. Wow. But it's not my goal. It's not my goal, you know. We'll get 
I was just thinking maybe good luck trying for this year or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think I'll say before they turn out a little bit. So yeah. Um we are joined today by 24 hours of Le- Ma winner in GT, 24 hours of Nurbert Ring, uh, multiple lap records, multiple tracks. Um, the fastest hands you're gonna see this side of a loose <laughs> F1 car. Um a wonderful father, uh, a husband, and a factory Porsche driver. Welcome, Kevin Estre. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's funny. I've seen you more in the last six months than I did in the prior seven and a half years because I just saw you at Spa. <laughs> um, you know, how's everything been? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Um, yeah, all good on the on the. On the racing side, uh, last year has been so-so. Let's say performance was okay, but but result was not as the uh, as we wanted, or we didn't achieve right. the goals we wanted. Um, and on the personal side, uh, got a got a daughter. Now I have a son and a daughter. We just built a, a house, uh, which we moved in 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 the winter. So it's all good. Set for for a new life with the hypercar. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And 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 arguably that is probably the top, uh, you know, buzz right now is uh, Porsche's assault on the new LMDH category. Um, if I throw the, the the calendar back, I remember asking you in 2015, you know, what's the five year plan? <laughs> and I think you had said. Uh, to make an absolute attempt at or win Le Mans outright in a within LMP car, LMP one. Um and it and, and it looks like dreams do come true. Yeah, I did manage the five years time frame though. Uh it took me take me seven, but uh, or eight, but uh but it's okay. It's fine. <laughs> I'll take that yeah. for sure. No expiration on dreams, huh? <laughs> no. no um, yeah, but uh, oh really, really glad with uh, that that happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What 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 has it been like? And and let's go back a little bit. How soon did you kind of think that you were in the running to be plucked? I mean, your teammate, Michael Christensen, the two of you have had a lot of success in the 991 and 992 uh G yeah. or RSR, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um People wouldn't know I was a Porsche yeah. guy. Oh, uh, was, oh, was he your teammate as well when you drove LMP2 that one year? Uh, no, no, it was uh, Lawrence Vantor. Oh, okay. Which is ah. funny because he's going to be my teammate this year. So, um, so it's, right. uh, it, it was our first Le Mans, uh, both of them, of us uh, in 2015. And now it's going to mm-hmm. be our first Le Mans together in uh, in LMDH, uh, in, in the hypercar class. So it's, uh, it's good. But... Uh, no, otherwise, yeah, Michael Christensen was my teammate. Uh, pretty much every race as I've drove between 2018 and and now. So wow. So how soon did you think that you were going to be in the running per se? I think um, when the first discussion came uh, between. FIA, WEC, and IMSA to try to merge some regulation to be able to to be able to uh, to have a a car uh, which can do both championship and everything. Uh, there uh, at that time, the head of or kind of the our spoken person at Porsche Motorsport was a, a French guy, Pascal Zurlinden, which is not there anymore. Uh, and he was in charge of all of all this discussion and everything. And and at that time, we could speak with him very very openly. And and uh, mm-hmm. and they already, my both Michael and myself. I remember it was probably Spa, uh, WEC in two thousand nineteen, uh, where he told us, you know, it's going good. I think something is going to happen. Blah blah blah. And we thought we looked at each other and thought, ah, if he tells us this, then it means that he think of us, you know, to to put us there. So this was the first, I think, sign. Um, and then I think having the trust and uh, the faith uh, that that if I do well in GT uh, with Porsche, if I if I do good results, if I if I behave well and everything, that I should have my chance. Uh, this I always had the the trust in this because that's how Porsche worked the last uh, 20, 30 years. Um, yep. And finally, 
yeah, it did happen. Um, I, I was quite confident with the last three, four seasons I made with Porsche that I, I would get a chance at least to test the car and, and, uh, and to be able to, to show what I can, um, to know if I would get the right, this is another thing, but at first, the most important is to, to be able to, to test and, and, uh, and show what you can. Did in the that, end, they took I mean, me without testing. They, they took me without ah, testing. So, so it was good. <laughs> that's, that's mega. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's all, there's always a certain amount of underlying aligning, um, pressure being a factory driver. I mean, results, results, results qualify that one lap window of qualifying. But once you knew that, once you had spoken to that gentleman, the French guy per se, uh, in 2019, and you kind of felt that way, did that put any added pressure to continue with the results any more than the already? No, I, I don't think so because I, I felt, uh, f- let's say to so- for my first year at Porsche 2016 was a tough year mentally because I, I made some mistakes. We were not there in Le Mans or we, we had a bad performance on some races, etc. And 2017 was for me a good performance year, but without good results. And 18 was performance and results. And since mm-hmm. 2018, somehow I, I think I performed well every year. And so my okay. my confidence was was quite high. Um, still made mistakes, and and uh, and for sure I could be faster at some 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 stages and everything. Uh, nobody's perfect, but I I felt I felt good, and I didn't feel more pressure because I knew I I felt so well in this RSR project and also in the in the GT3 R in the races I I've done on the Nurburgring in Spa that yes. I knew you know I, if I continue doing this if I don't don't do huge mistakes or or really uh, disappoint people. Then I, I I should be in, you know. And and this is the way I felt. And I didn't add pressure because the pressure I had was to perform in the RSR anyway, or to perform every race I do. And uh, and I didn't need a an extra performance, you know, for uh, to get to LMDH. I think. All right. So something like that. Like, what, what are you doing to stay, you know? keep your senses all nice and tight and everything during the off season, like from now and during the winter time, you know, uh, first race is coming up for Daytona. Um, but what are you doing? Are you, are you carding at all? Are you doing, you know, we know you're affiliated with Manthai racing and you do a lot of, you know, track days on the Nürburgring there. So what are you, what are you doing to, to keep your senses, you know, uh, the weather in uh, the weather in Europe is, uh, where I live is, is not good enough. I would say to, uh, to test really, or you could do some, some go karts, uh, but, uh, but I didn't really have the time for it and, and not the material and everything. Um, to be honest, we tested, uh, until, until December, you know, uh, going over ski with the LMDH and, and, and U S mm-hmm. and everything. Um, then December, let's say from beginning of December until now, I haven't, touch a race car um which is it is what it is uh yeah. it's gonna be i think one and a half months without touching a race car until daytona raw which is mm-hmm. very actually very short for for winter break you know it depends com- depending on which championship you do for example if you do dtm you stop in october and you restart in may and and wow. because <laughs> And because in Europe, the weather is not really good from, or not good enough apart from going really south, uh, Portugal or, or Spain from November yeah. to March, you don't drive really. So some drivers, really good drivers, professional drivers don't drive for five months. And it's been like mm-hmm. this since ever. And we are fortunate enough to do a world championship and to drive on, on different continent and, and, and to have actually a very short winter break. So okay. I hope that my reflex are still going to be as good as last year. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> do, do, but, do you yeah, do any sim racing? No, I don't. I don't. So uh, okay. I, uh, the only simulator I I, uh, I drive is the one from Porsche, which we uh, which we do from time to time to prepare races, to develop the, the car and everything. Um, and this is during the season quite often, uh, or let's say regularly in the winter. For me a little less now i think i didn't drive the sim for one and a half month um mm. but i already spent my time watching you know daytona last year and and you know watching on board watching some some races uh which which i've done uh, yeah 
just to to keep mm -hmm. the mood, you know. Um. So it, I have a question. I've seen pictures and video of the Porsche simulator. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's a full. It's a full chassis in front of a massive screen, high res, and there's full motion. How precise is that? I mean, I've done some sim. Larry does, mm -hmm. you know, it's really popular now. But how precise yeah. is it from the car to that? Ah, it's, it's really precise. It's really precise. Mm. You can, we, we really use this professionally. We, you know, uh, we do testing. We, uh, we do half a millimeter ride height testing in the simulator uh, to know if it's, <laughs> this is going to be in the right direction or not. For sure, it's oh. not 100, it, it's never 100% the, re the race car because there's so much factors, you know, on a race, yeah. already just from one day to another in a race car, uh, the track can be one second quicker, you know, because of whatever yeah. temperature, rubber. So this factor you don't have in the sim. The sim has the racetrack, Porsche buys the the very good racetrack scanned where, where you have all the details and everything, which is very important. Then we have a tire model from Michelin. So Michelin developed, okay, yeah. which this is, this is for sure very important as well, because otherwise, if you don't have the tire, you drive in the race car, it doesn't make sense. Um, and, and you have better sessions than others. For sure, uh, there are some, some time where you go there, you do a test day and you know, some track is is better than other for some reason uh or, or you have a better feeling or the car behave exactly as the race car sometimes there's an offset and you have to either chase it or leave it because if you chase it and and manipulate the sim then you in any way don't you're not going to have the results you want to have uh the correlation will not will not be good so there's for sure yeah. some some details which you have to keep in mind and it's not one to one but it's very close uh, it's it's a very good tool <clears throat> to to have an idea of what you need on this racetrack with this car um right. and and develop some you know some some uh, strategy setup strategy okay you can have one two strategy one two three and then go from there from on the racetrack uh, and this you can you can for sure do the biggest work on in the sim Speaking of strategy, <clears throat> as an example, in music, the bass player and the drummer are very, very connected, right? That's what we hear in a live concert. That's what makes us really get into it. On the racetrack, it's like driver and engineer. How critical has that relationship been with your engineers at Porsche on getting that one lap quality uh, window with what people say the Michelin's being a, a kind of a peaky tire for qualifying, if, if, if I'm yeah. right. Um, what, what, what's that relationship like between your engineer and yourself? Uh, it's the, uh, you can be the best driver in the world. If, if you don't understand if your communication with the engineer, if you, if your engineer doesn't understand your need, you will not, you'll not do the poll, you know, because we are in yeah. such competitive championship that, if you're missing two, three tenths, you're not doing the pole. And if the car is not perfect, you miss two, three tenths on one lap. Uh, so this is for sure very, very important. And and the routine and the experience you have with your engineer makes for me the biggest difference. Um, in last year, in 2021, I've done all the qualifying in WEC uh, with the RSR. And uh, I've done all the pole apart from Le Mans, where I crashed. Um, <laughs> uh and and there there i felt it because because i had the routine of the qualifying i knew exactly what i need to warm the tire up uh and and what balance i need with all tires to when you put the new tire you always have a bit of a balance shift what do mm -hmm. i need there we did a quali sim and i knew okay you know what what do i have to do in the quali sim to uh, to get a good car if the car is not great in the quali sim then what do we need to change and the communication with your engineer and, and the fact that when you tell the engineer, I have a little too much oversteer in turn three on entry, he knows a little too much oversteer is one click of, of uh, sway bar or, or it mm -hmm. is, it is camber. Is it three clicks? You know, it depends how, how you speak. And this you get with the experience you have with your engineer together, uh, working together. And, and this we were, I believe, very, very strong in WC because we, 
we worked together since 2017. So, um, ah, okay. so, and, and it, this makes a difference for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, on top of the team dynamics with, along with the engineer, I mean, you have two other drivers that you're sharing a car with, right? Like how, how do you, obviously Christensen, you've been with him for a while, but how do you guys build and maintain that relationship on and off the track? Uh, yeah, this is, this is as important as the engineer, how, how you fit with your teammate, because you drive, let's say in the WC and GT, you had one teammate for the whole season and a second one for, uh, for Le Mans. You were three in Le Mans, but two for the whole championship. Oh. And, uh, and with Michael, we have quite a similar driving style, not exactly the same, but very similar. And, and we need, we have the same needs in the car. You know, some drivers really like understeer, some drivers hate oversteer, whatever. And for us, we, we like a balanced car and, and not too much understeer, but very similar. And, uh, and this again is the, is the, the experience and, and the, the trust in your teammate when he set up the car. When you do a compromise in, in free practice two, for example, uh, I don't drive. Michael drive the whole one and a half hour and he developed the car mm -hmm. for him at that stage. And I have to be fully confident that when I jump in in FP3, that it's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty much the race car I will have because we don't have any more practice, and uh, and this trust you build throughout the years, um, and and for sure it's very important then to have a, a teammate which has the same point of view than you, same same idea of motorsports, um, mm -hmm. of what you need to win the races and what you need in the car to be able to be quick. And this we had with Michael. I think that's why that's explained also uh, how success, successful we were together. And uh, mm -hmm. and with Lawrence Vanto as a third driver in Le Mans was also is also very similar. And uh, so this was uh, I think one one of our strengths and one a bit of luck because when Porsche put us together, we didn't know each other well. They didn't know really, mm -hmm. us, uh, and it worked. Mm -hmm. And and you know you have some. Some guys in in history, like uh, this uh, Lotera, Fasla, uh, Trelier, which won Le Mans, and and you you always hear well, we had a great, you know, we were working well together and everything worked well, and that's how you you win these big races. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can have two very fast drivers, but if they don't work together and if they don't fit together, you're not going to win endurance races. Yeah. We when we spoke uh, eight years ago, <laughs> uh, I interviewed you, and I was asking you. I think at that time you had just done Le Mans in the LMP2 Oak Racing, yeah. And you know, on in, at K Pax, I get to look at everyone's in car, right? And I, I used to talk to you. I used to tell you, like, amazing, <laughs> amazing hands. But you had said that you had to calm down your steering inputs in the LMP car. Tell us about the first time you drove the 964 um, in testing, like the very first time. Did, had you done sim of the 64 and then drove the actual car? And what was it like? Yeah, I, I drove one time the sim before I before I jumped into the car. Um, and to be honest, I, I was the second driver uh, within the development time. So I drove quite early in the in the process. I think it was the third day of the car. And it mm. was in Weissach, so in the, the home track of Porsche. You know, it's quite yeah. a small track. It was, I think, mid-January, mid uh, three degrees centigrade, so, so whatever, <laughs> <laughs> cold. <laughs> uh, what's that? Uh, 35 oh. uh, Fahrenheit. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and for sure it was not the the time where you push like hell and you you know you go to the mm -hmm. limit and everything and and we had a, quite a heavy steering at that stage we made some improvement later so actually you could not have really fast hand you know because it was quite quite tough to see yeah. <laughs> anyway but uh but yeah for sure you have to come into a into a different mode you have to let's say uh forget it about your your instinct driving style which mm. mine is is quite aggressive and quite quick on the hands as you said the turn in and therefore also the correction because you are entering a new car you don't know how it's going to react so you have to think a little more um yeah. you anyway have to think a lot because it's complicated car and and new environment and everything 
and just trying to to slow down a little on everything um and especially because it was not a performance test it was a development test on the home track you take it everything mm -hmm. a little easier and, and slower you know and try to to have a little uh, yeah a little more feeling and and try to be a little smoother wow <laughs> so so between you have did you ever do any more lmp testing between the 24 you know that 2015 year and the new no. 963 coming up no never so ne ne never. They, they never gave you a chance at the 919 hybrid huh no no because when <laughs> i entered porsche the lineups were all done and uh mm -hmm. and it's anyway stayed one and a half year or two years and uh and that was finished so i i've never drove this car i hope that I'm gonna. Uh, I hope to have the chance at Red Sport or some some event sometime to to drive this car. Yeah, sweet. So then, and because uh, what they had, they came out with the other Evo version that was just fully, you know, untethered, right? Falls out, nothing. Uh, you know, it wasn't restricted by any means. Yeah, this was this was probably crazy. That's I think the only car which which is running <laughs> uh, from this from this 919. You know, if if I'm gonna oh, really? drive, I think uh, one car one day. I think it's gonna be it's gonna be this one. I think the other one are. <laughs> I think at the moment it's the only car which drive. For sure, they can build some others, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, no, it's it's it would be really yeah. fun to drive this one day. So so I want to go back to uh to, to your McLaren days. I remember. <laughs> You know, we were sitting in the office and I was, I, I would be writing invoices and Miles said, you know, you got to come over and check out this in car. I'm like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll come over. <laughs> yeah, at the time, I, you know, I wasn't, you know, wasn't sure of who you were and anything. And he's like, man, just like watching how quick your hands are, your, your reaction speed. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? You know, then overall, you know, throughout the year, you know, I see more in car of this guy. Like, Holy crap. You know, and then obviously the, the, the Coda race in the rain, <laughs> you know, uh, said you, you walk the field on that and you're, I mean, just every corner, you're, to the limit, you know, reaction so quick. Um, 32 second lead. Yeah. <laughs> 32 second lead. Actually, actually, probably what stood out to me, Coda 2015, first race in the rain, was with the 32 second lead. And I've watched in car all the way through. At, at the end of the race with that lead, you weren't letting on. Like your lap times at the end were almost like your lap times at the beginning of it. I mean, it was crazy. And what's required for that level of concentration and focus? Um, like, where does that come from? Is that is that a carding thing, or is that just just yeah, instincts um, of years of carding? Or, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's many things. Um, at first, it's never you know you have some some races where you perform you have an outstanding performance and this one one of this one was one of these and uh, where i felt i felt good that's what you said with the i had a lot of lead but i still drove at the limit because i felt i could handle it and i felt good the car was good and yeah. i had never a surprise you know i i was always in control um and and this happens sometimes and sometimes it doesn't happen and and there you have to be then uh, let's say uh, awake enough or, or smart enough or whatever mm -hmm. aware enough to calm down and and re, you know uh, remove a few tents because otherwise you're gonna crash this is experience which which helps you yeah. to to uh to achieve this i i crashed some cars because i was too much on the limit where i where i should not have been uh and mm -hmm. i hope i'm you know that's that's the way it is uh i for sure made some mistakes and um but but I think I think go kart helps you a lot on that starting early. Um, you know, I, I started when I was four years old. The first time I sat in in a in a go kart, and and for sure, all these experience you get from four year old until you are thirty four, as I'm now getting older, older uh, helps you. <laughs> every lap you do, every lap you do, every different car, every every. Um, different situation helps you or you have to you have to remember it and and you know get it to your mind the mistakes you do um so this is i think this is this is the thing and 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 the instinct of course you have to drive with your instinct especially on the rain i would say because mm -hmm. on the dry you drive with your instinct but also 
you know exactly where you break this the conditions normally are the same you know when you drive every lap lap by lap just the tire changes a little bit but otherwise everything is the same in the rain you can have two laps with a lot of rain two laps with less you know some aquaplaning some not there you have to drive more with your instinct and uh and my instinct on the rain was always pretty good and and i think i this plus the experience uh makes some some good good races oh yeah i think you know rain and like you know obviously the nurburg rain you know half course is wet half of it is dry i mean obviously people are still talking about your pass on the grass before and you know it's it, like something like that your instincts like you i mean you had such a good run on the mercedes going down back street and it seemed like you had no other chance but to pass them right like you 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 were already there um but how how when well, you know, walk us through what were your emotions like that what if the how risky of a pass was that looking back on it uh, it is uh looking back on it i always think Phew, I, I mean this was too much in the end it went well but, it was too much. <laughs> but but in the car you as you said you have to go with your instinct at that time it was fighting for the lead uh i was coming yeah. back and and the number thing the dirty thing i heard the straight is super wide you can have four or five cars you know but we were running mm -hmm. on uh, we were closing on a small bmw which was on the right side of the track and yep. I knew, and he moved a bit to the left, and I knew if I'm going to go between them, he's going to squeeze me. Then then I have no room with the BMW. Right. So I had I had to go left. And uh, where the BMW is not, and, and the Mercedes was closing the door all the time, and there is this mm -hmm. 2,000 of a second uh, decision. Either you lift, because he pushed you towards the grass, you lift and you get your chance next lap or whatever, or mm -hmm. you keep your foot on and and put some uh, part of the car on the grass and hope that at one point he opens. And there I took this decision, <laughs> this this risky decision, which in the end went really well. Um, but he pushed me quite quite a lot. I had half of the car in the grass. And there I was like, okay, now uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the shit. There is no way back. You know, I'm in, I'm in the grass. <laughs> I'm flat out. If I, mm. if I lift... I might spin, you know, because right. because for sure there I was just trying to to be as constant as possible with my steering straight, trying to to get the car as straight as possible and and my foot down. And I saw the the big curb coming towards me uh, because the corner was approaching. And there the curb was exactly in the middle of the car, and it was that high, oh. one one <laughs> foot high. And I thought, hopefully he opens before because otherwise I'll have to to lift, uh, but. But you never know what what happened there, and he just opened a bit before we came back, and I just made it back to the track before this curb started. So <laughs> it was uh, it was quite uh, yeah uh, exciting in the car. Then I had the engineer mm -hmm. engineer call on the radio, which was pretty calm. But then I saw the video on the uh, from the pit, <laughs> and they were not so calm. Yeah, <laughs> like I I don't I think I was editing something. I had a I had a. At a deadline. I don't know what I was doing, but I actually had watched it earlier. And when that happened, I, I didn't see it happen. My phone, I got like 12 texts. People are like, did you see? Did you see? Did you see? <laughs> you know, and, and, and people were doing screenshots. And I'm like, whoa. So yeah, that was that was that was like that definitely <laughs> is one for the record books. Um question. And and I, you know, like we have these, we have these questions lined up, but I just thought of this. Have you driven the new G nine nine two GT three RS yet? No, not yet. Not this ah, one. Ah. Uh, I, I okay. should have last year. I should have last year, but uh, but I was not available. Or Porsche asked me, and and I was not available, and uh, mm -hmm. and therefore it didn't happen. And um, and I think Jörg, since now Jörg Bergmeister is retired, I, I took his retirement as a race driver. He's <laughs> developing this car. And uh, yeah. and I think uh, he made a mega job, and they were happy with his. They were happy with uh, with the performance of the car on the Nurburgring with his performance, um, and therefore I think they didn't call me, <laughs> or oh, not for the record. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I hope I'm gonna drive this car soon, but uh, but so far mm -hmm. not. Yeah. So so along that, you know, your whole relationship with Manthai Racing, you guys, you know, build development packages. For these, you know, amazing GZ cars are already crazy from Porsche out of the box. What what is your role in the development? How do you guys go about the R and D for you know the, the nine nine one GT three 
you know, and all, all the GT cars. And I presumably, I assume you guys have something coming up for the GT4 RS. Yeah, this I, I can't tell. You have to uh, ask uh, Manti Racing straight. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, for me, uh, it's, it's basically Manta is doing, let's say, 80 80 to 90 percent of the development themselves with their uh, their own driver the the um, the chief of red at manta racing is also very good amateur driver or almost professional like he's he's very fast he's doing races on the nurburgring in race cars and stuff mm -hmm. so he's doing basically pretty much the whole process of of developing the car and then Manta calls me basically two months before the record attempt. Uh, mm -hmm. Normally, I go in, the, I jump in the car, I do a test day or, or a few runs. Then we do some small adjustment because I I would prefer this or that or we you know whatever mm -hmm. uh, rear wing or camber or some some little things. But I, I have to say, the Christoph Breuer is is the name of the this driver. He he does it very well. So I arrive and the car is pretty much you know uh pretty much perfect Ready to rock. Mm -hmm. just a little bit here and there because my style is different than his style and um and that's mm -hmm. it uh so I, i'm not really part of the development because i don't have the time uh, for and and Manti has great people and great engineers to to do it themselves without having having me doing that but uh, let's say the little You're already there the last little yeah, the, the last little <laughs> things uh, before I, I I do the record attempt to to help me to gain maybe one or two seconds. Um, this this I do. Question: um, Last night I looked at I looked at the whole lap of the the McLaren 12C <laughs> uh, with door racing from I think 2014. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you went from the McLaren 650 SGT3 to the RSR. What was that jump like in terms of, and, and, and I know I keep saying it, driving style. And I'm only saying that because a lot of our viewers, a lot of our followers are Subaru enthusiasts or, you know, some Miata and, and BRZ and so on and so forth. Um, and our cars just push like crazy. And I remember the 12C being a big understeering car. Um, and that's probably putting it politely. <laughs> um, what was it like going from that to a car that historically has lots of front end turn in and grip? Um, yeah, very different. But but the RSR is a the RSR is an amazing car. It, it's a Porsche. I mean, we I, I started my career with Porsche with the RSR with the rear engine, um, mm -hmm. which I knew from the Cup car. But the RSR is uh, there, and the Cup car is. Yeah, you know, there's a huge, yeah. huge step. The RSR is, is no compromise on the development. There's only, only the compromise from the great regulation, from homologation, and the rest, you know, you can change kinematic, dampers, everything. Mm. And, and so <laughs> you you get pretty much the car, the car you want as a driver. You know, you don't, you are not so you are not so limited in in terms of setup and and uh, and car balance. So, mm. and with my experience from the cup car, I have to say, I felt really good straight away with the rear engine. Um, uh, and everything in the RSR is, is, was very natural and pretty easy. I have to say, because you have confidential tires, you have very good tires, uh, mm. which, which have a peak, but lasts, uh, two stints, uh, you know, it, ah. This makes quite a difference. Uh, when when we were speaking about the GT3, the the 650, the McLaren, you are driving there mm -hmm. on Pirelli customer tire, which are tires um, which should work at quota at uh, you know four degrees Celsius uh, track and uh, Laguna Seca in hot summer <laughs> at fifty degree mm -hmm. track. So they can't be as good as a as a confidential tire which has a window of you know fifteen degree track and then you have another tire. And this makes quite a big difference on how the car behave yeah. and, and how you can play with the car because the tire always works. It's always in the window. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I felt good, I have to say, going in the RSR straight away. Uh, for sure, I had to to re, to re relearn some stuff, but uh, but my instinct was correct straight away and I, and I could drive without thinking too much, which was, I think, uh, important. So, because that, that same year, well, shortly between that time frame is when the RSR went the, the forward mid engine, 
All right. So did did having experience in the 650S with the mid-engine rear-wheel drive, mm. did that, you know, translate any at all going to the new RSR? Yeah, yeah, I think I had because uh, Porsche had a lot of drivers which uh, drove rear engine for the last uh, decades or, or 15 right. years. <laughs> they haven't driven any mid engine forever. So I mm -hmm. was a, a, a new guy there developing a car, a mid engine, which I've been driven for the last two years in another category, but very similar car in the end. So I, I, I could bring my my experience there. Uh, Lawrence Vantor was also there, uh, but he arrived at the end of the development uh, coming from Audi, which also was a mid-engine. So um, so yeah, I think there, there my experience from McLaren for sure helps uh, during the development and also to, to feel also at home straight away, which my other Porsche colleagues, uh, like Richard Leeds, like uh, like this guy, mm -hmm. you know, which, which drove Porsche since 2006, 2007, only re-engine. <laughs> Um, they never drove any mini car, so uh, so this right. was for sure something <laughs> something new for them, and and McLaren helped there, helped me there mm -hmm. for sure. What's uh what's your favorite U.S. track? My favorite U.S. track, uh, Barber. I really like Barber, uh, and yeah, Sebring probably because of the. Yeah. The challenge, but from let's say the uh, the layout and how beautiful mm -hmm. the track is, I have to say, Barber, uh, that that uh, that weekend we've done in the PWC with the McLaren was a mm -hmm. was a dream for me. I really love that. Yes, I mean Sebring. We I remember what, this past year, twenty twenty two, when you, your pass over the Corvette on the back straight. I mean, you uh, you had the ins you got the run on them, side drafted, took that inside line. And I mean, so it was like, how, again, how much do you guys do in the simulator? Like, I, that's a bumpy track for people who don't know. That you know, used to be an old airport ship, and it is bumpy all the way through. And especially that turn 17, to hold that line and to carry that speed all the way throughout, you know, how, how much prepping goes into the car, especially for, for Sebring? Yeah, Sebring is a Sebring is a is a different is on a different planet. You know, it's not a, it's not a race car <laughs> race car track. It's more of a motocross track. You know, <laughs> uh, so it, it's there's a lot of a lot of prep uh, on the sim on the on the rig. You know, on the on the damper rig uh, on the seven post on simulation um, mm. and and experience also from the previous years. Uh, yeah. But for sure, it's, it's a very tough track. It, it's very difficult there to be to have the right the right setup because you uh, you want to be soft for the bump, but you don't want to be too soft to lose some grip because you have a lot of a lot of you need a lot of grip there mechanical wise. Right. But if you're too soft, you're gonna lose a lot of grip. You're gonna gain some ride, help some ride, but then lose the grip. And this is the compromise you have to to take. And there are let's say, uh, different philosophy of setup. Um, and there you always have to choose one to start the weekend and, and try to keep it and try to improve bit by bit. Um, but it's a, it's a very tough track for the engineers and, and for the drivers, for sure. Question. Um, when you are behind a car that you have caught, and you know most people know that catching a car is one thing, but passing it's another thing. But when you're behind that car that you want to pass, how do you maintain uh, control of your emotions and, and and not trying to pass too soon since you probably have to back off a little bit, but then you have, you have a window that you can get it done? Um, for me... My my father always always taught me since I'm since I'm a kid in go kart. When you're behind, when you arrive to somebody, don't spend too much time. If you spend too much time, mm. he's gonna know where you're fast, where you're not, and you're never gonna over overtake him. And when you go, go. You know, don't don't hesitate because this is where you crash. And this is mm. what I learned very early in my in my career, and I and I think I apply this every time I I come to. To a car it's let's say my instinct now and and i don't have to think about too much i try to to recognize my strengths and his weakness very early in the process let's say within as soon as i can see him and i'm let's say within two seconds i i, I know where i'm strong where he's not and and trying to build up the the past in this in this phase already when i'm catching him before i'm uh, before i'm actually really behind him getting in in a position mm -hmm. to pass 
and um, and that's how I how I do it. And uh, and there you have to try to find the right moments depending on the race situation, the championship situation, how much risk you can take. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to you have to take more risk and go like this and go for it and and think that okay, <laughs> you know something bad can happen and sometimes you know you have time you just have to wait and and try to see uh, it's never the same situation every race every every pass is different but but this is the let's say my my strategy and the way i i treat passes is, mm -hmm. is to try to prepare as early as possible um, do you miss the standing start uh, races in the States? I miss the standing start. I'm not sure because the McLaren suck. <laughs> 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 but but the, the sprint, the sprint racing in the state, I miss for sure, because I, yeah. I really like I really like this, uh, this format of, of giving it all for one hour or 45 minutes mm. or whatever and, and try to yeah, to use the tires you have for that hour and and uh, yeah, get the risk. You know, there you have a, a high risk reward quote. You know, if you uh, you have to take risk to win a race like this, and if you if you take too much risk, you do a mistake. Then is one sprint race from uh, you know whatever fifteen races, and not just one endurance race from six. Uh, and you're alone on the car and everything. So I, it's something for sure. I I liked and uh, and. Maybe in the future, uh, I don't know. I could do again. My, um, my cow is well. So last night I, I had a hard drive, and on it I had like I think it's labeled Mega Passes, right? And it's got, it has everybody from like 2011 on with KPAX at least. And in it was your in car from St. Pete, which is a street race for anyone that doesn't know. Um, and it was wet. <laughs> um, and it just reminded me of your performance at Macau, I believe. Um, a, there was that big pileup, and I don't remember if you were there that year. Um, but then oh. there was another instance at Macau. But but talk about the street races, which, I mean, I think Macau is one of the only ones other than the states, right? I mean, yeah. Which other than do. maybe Porsche yeah. Cup, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Talk about that. Yeah, it's. It's something I, I really love because uh, because you have to to be very precise. You have to take risks to be quick. You have to be very mm -hmm. close to the wall. Um, <laughs> have a very good overview on on how how big is your car or how small is your car, and uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, and push. You can't be quick if you don't push. And I think it suits my style well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I didn't win my car. I finished second, sadly. Uh, but uh, I love driving in Monaco or Norris Ring or these these street tracks uh, in in the Cup time and St Pete and and Long Beach was also something I I really uh, really enjoyed in in, uh, yeah. in the McLaren. So yeah, I don't know driving close to the wall at at 250 280 <laughs> kph uh, in Macau is, <laughs> is something proper. Yeah. So I mean, speaking of driving close to the wall. You you know people a lot of people don't know you you were you know, go karting and in Formula cars before you went to Carrera Cup right and so you know you've won the twenty four hour Le Mans would it be crazy to see you go for a go at you know Indy five hundred sometime later on? Um, uh, it's something I I have a lot of respect for I uh, to be honest I at first is quite far away from from us being. Porsche drivers doing endurance races in Europe. Uh, but I have a huge respect for all the drivers and the teams there because I know how what it takes, you know, to drive right. that that fast close to the wall. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I drive for Penske now and I think he's he has quite a good team in IndyCar, from what I've seen. So um, <laughs> so why not? Why not? I don't I don't rule it out. But uh, let's say it's not on my agenda. For the next years, I, I, I want to try right, to concentrate yeah. on, on what I'm doing. And I have a lot mm -hmm. of respect. So I, I, to be honest, I, I don't know if I would be, uh, if I would be um, good, good enough or whatever, or if I would have the, yeah, what it takes to, to be fast there, because the only oval I drove on is Daytona and there is quite easy to be fat, uh, to be flat mm -hmm. on the, on the oval um, doing the infield. So yeah, I don't know, but why not?
<laughs> what's uh what's your favorite non Porsche car? My favorite non Porsche car. That's a tough one. Uh, I mean, um, off the record. Cars, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. This part's not gonna air. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have to say, race car. The the last Ferrari GT3 car looks amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, which car? Yeah, for race car, I would I would say this um, as because it's a nice car and. Uh, mm. Yeah, I, I think Ferrari is the brand I, and f- the Ford GT, the Ford GT was an amazing okay. car. Yeah. The Ford yeah. GT is probably, you know, if there's one car I would like to buy one time and which is not a Porsche and it's for sure on my list. <laughs> That's awesome. But it's okay. It can be on record, whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have a, like, one thing I always pay attention to these these 12 13 years working for race team is i watch how drivers get in a zone before they go out whether it's before the race but particularly qualifying right because it's just such it's so intense and i i remember you seemed pretty relaxed like like you were very relaxed but once the door came down or once your helmet was on you <laughs> they like that was impenetrable like you you were you were somewhere else where do where do you go prior to that in your head in terms of the zone? Um, this is for me, as you said. I'm I'm relaxed before I jump in the car, but I always try to be ten minutes in the car before the session really starts, a qualifying especially. Um, and there I there I try to do the lap in my in my mind. You know, think about what I've seen on the videos, think about what I've seen on the data, where can I improve what's in very important in this corner? Um, what's the breaking point in this corner? Um, uh, you know, what do I have to take care, especially for qualifying compared to the speed we had in, in practices? Um, and this is what I do really. Normally I close my eyes, think about the turn one, turn two, turn three, what do I have to do in this corner? Um, yeah. uh, try to for sure make sure I have all the setting correct on my steering wheel and uh, and then off we go Kevin it, it, it's it been an absolute yeah. pleasure like I really mean that yeah, um, this is me yeah I mean yeah. watching you know since McLaren days watching in car and ever since you know now all the Porsche stuff and now finally getting talked to you one on one it's a dream you know like for us you know you're an idol for us like some people have movie stars you know us race hard guys it's, it's you it you is know, you so. yeah thank you. And, and, and thank you so and, much and we're not just we're not just saying no. that because you're here like i'm not going to say that to the next guy <laughs> but yeah, I, no. I will listen to lot. make sure i will listen yeah, to yeah. The next one to sure. um, so, so well when, when can people expect to see your first outing in, in the new 963 uh, it's going to be Sebring, uh, Sebring 12 hours in March. Oh. So, uh, oh, Sebring 12 hours, not sorry. Sebring eight hours in the WEC, uh, during the Sebring okay. 12 hours weekend. So it's going to be on Friday before the, before the 12 hours. So middle of March in Sebring, first race of the WEC and, uh, hopefully a win for our Porsche. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. Is, uh, is there anything you want to plug, uh, social media, you know? people kevin estra you know where to find you <laughs> all good yeah so yeah just write kevin estra on on social media and normally you should find me and um yeah give a follow and uh and uh, give a follow to rest comp engineering and kw which, like, <laughs> which are doing pretty good pretty good dampers because that's what we have on the notch life and and we win quite a lot of races there so so it's funny you say that like we definitely should do a plug for kw yeah, yeah. <laughs> um they you know it's People say to me, "Why should I buy your shocks over other brands?" And and and, and this is a good plug. No, and, and and I tell them, "Well, KW makes the shocks that are on the Cayman Cup, nine eleven Cup, uh, RSR, you know." Um, and that speaks volumes. But uh, but thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Tell Carolyn I said hi. I've not met Tommy yet or Bella, um, but I hope to in the soon. I'm sure I'll see you at Spa, twenty four. Yeah. Actually, yeah, no. Let's see. Wait. Let's see. GT, yeah. Let's see. So, Let's see. Maybe. 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 Yeah. But thank you very much. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kevin. Cheers. All right. Take care. Yeah.